If you've been around for a while, then you know how much I care about financial freedom for all. One thing that often gets in the way of that is debt. That's why I'm happy to announce that I've partnered with an amazing organization called Juno. Juno helps you get lower interest rates by using the power of group negotiation. It is a completely free resource that you can use to secure lower interest rates on new and existing student loans. Head to the link in the episode show notes to find out more. This is the Dreamers Podcast, episode 43 with Patrice Washington. Today is November 9th, 2021. Having that philosophy of like an audience of one is still an audience. I'm going to show up and serve no matter what. I think that has been the foundation for my success, for like what I do, because people know that I'm going to do my best no matter who's there. I don't only show up when it seems impressive. I'm going to show up anyway because this is what I get to do, not what I have to do. Hello, world. Welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. I am Stephanie Annie's, also known as Annie's Wealth. I'm a financial coach and an author. I self-published my first book, Dream of Legacy, a guide to help dreamers reach financial independence and build generational wealth. In this podcast, I'll have conversations with experts and thought leaders who dare to follow their dreams. You'll hear about their journey and their money stories. I hope it inspires you, dreamers out there, to live life on your own terms. Come on, dreamers. Let's change the world. This podcast is brought to you by Dream of Legacy. Check out dreamoflegacy.com for resources to assist you on your journey to financial independence. Before we get into today's episode, please take a couple minutes to go into Apple Podcasts, if you're listening from an Apple device, to rate and review the podcast. If you appreciate the free resources that are provided in this podcast, then the best way to let me know is to do just that. Reviews help the podcast be more visible and it helps other dreamers discover the podcast. So thank you. I appreciate you. And now let's get back to today's episode. Hello. Welcome to the Dreamers Podcast. I'm your host, Anise Wealth, and I'm just so happy that you've decided to tune in for today's episode. Today, I'm chatting with Patrice Washington. We talk about how to redefine wealth for yourself. Can you imagine coming from humble beginnings, building a seven-figure business in your 20s, and losing it all? Well, that's what happened to Patrice. And in today's episode, she talks about how she was able to build it back better and how we should be chasing purpose, not money. Patrice is the host of the award-winning The Redefining Wealth podcast. In 2020, Success Magazine named her as one of the 12 inspiring Black voices in personal development. She's a personal finance expert who's been featured everywhere. You might remember her as the personal finance expert on the Steve Harvey Morning Show. Her podcast, the Redefining Wealth podcast, has had over 7 million downloads. She's the author of five books and so much more. Here is Patrice Washington. Patrice Washington, welcome to the Dreamers podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to have you here. I have to share some backstory for the listeners here. <laughs> So it's just so that I know how much this interview means to me and the power of setting intentions. So before we started recording, we were talking about participated in your Created for Purpose Challenge. It was a free five-day challenge and it had such a positive impact on me. And during that time, you said, when you get an opportunity to speak up for what you want, take it. And I remember after that, reaching out to you and you know I was getting ready to launch my podcast. And I asked you if you would be a guest. And at the time you said, circle back when you get to 25 episodes. And so I actually went into my calendar. I counted 27 weeks. I created a calendar event saying, book Patrice on the podcast. And so I reached out to you when I got to 20, I think 27 episodes or so. And mm -hmm. here we are. So I'm so excited to have you. 
Well, I was sharing with you that not very many people are that committed. I get requests to be on podcasts, obviously, every day, all day. And if I did just say yes to everything, I would not have a business. I would do nothing else but do podcast interviews. And so a lot of people will say, oh, okay, but they never commit to actually their podcast, their audience, what they say their purpose is. If they're interested, they're not necessarily committed. So Patrice, for the dreamers who might not be familiar with you, can you share a little bit about you and what you do? So first of all, hey, dreamers, thanks for being here. Who am I? I would say at this point in my life, I consider myself to still be a financial expert. I'm, I'm the host of the Redefining Wealth podcast. I've done a lot in the financial space, but at the core, I'm a woman who is just really passionate about helping other women in particular. I love everybody, but women in particular redefine wealth for themselves. And that is because of not just textbook, but testimony, right? So my backstory is, I got started in real estate actually at 19 years old. And then I became a real estate and mortgage broker at 21 years old, seven figure business by 25 with my now husband, then boyfriend, or he liked me real hard back then. We started this business, became a seven figure business. And I thought that I had achieved what my family who came to this country for me to have these opportunities. I thought they would feel like, hey, I hit the American dream. I'm out here living life, doing very well. And then the recession hits. And when the recession hits, I am in the hospital on bed rest. I had taken a fall down the stairs while I was 20 weeks pregnant. And when I got to the emergency room, they said, ma'am, this baby's coming any minute now. And I did the only thing I knew to do, at least at that time, which was pray and call and ask other people to pray for me. And what was supposed to be any minute now turned into me being in the hospital for 10 weeks on hospital bed rest. So here I'm in the hospital 10 weeks. I'm watching the news every day and the banks that I work with are closing down. The mortgage industry is like blowing up. My 16 loan officers and real estate agents are calling me every day, freaking out. And here I am on bed rest. I can't move. I can't help them. I can't help myself. About five weeks in, my doctor comes in and she says, Patrice, if you don't stop stressing out because we're reading the monitors every day, you're going to leave here two years in a row with no baby. Because the year before, I gave birth to a son, same hospital, same doctor, same floor. He died after five hours in my arms. So here I am again in this hospital, and I'm being warned this time, look, you need to stop. You need to figure out how you're going to, like, stop stressing out. And that was the first lesson that I got in surrendering and learning that surrender was not giving up. It's letting go. It was letting go of whatever control I thought I had at that time and really leaning into my faith. And so I asked them to take the TV off the wall. Didn't even want to be tempted to look at the television and feed into all the fear and negativity and uncertainty, much like the stuff we've experienced over the last year, right? I didn't even want to be tempted by it. So I asked them to take the TV off the wall. And for the last five weeks of my hospital stay, I read my Bible, I listened to praise and worship music, and I just faithed my way through it. And so I gave birth to my daughter 10 weeks early, three pounds, two ounces, but she was healthy. And she stayed in the NICU for three and a half weeks. And then I ended up leaving the hospital with this beautiful baby girl, healthy. But I also left with a healthy amount of medical debt, almost $400,000 because my insurance had dropped me. And so now here I am. I think I'm living the dream. Mm -hmm. But I find myself in the hospital for two and a half months, three months when you include my daughter's stay. Now I've racked up hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical debt. No deals closed tons of overhead. I have tenants in my properties who are not paying rent because they've lost their jobs in the recession. And everything that I thought I knew just months before, upside down. And so I would say even the reason that I'm here today is because I know what it's like to be a dreamer who has to dream a new dream. Like when you feel like you've done the stuff and you've made it and then life happens. And now you have to embrace, okay, like maybe that wasn't it. There must be something else. And for me, the something else came after we foreclosed on our home, our cars were repossessed, everything that could happen was happening. And I ended up leaving my home in California and fleeing to Metairie, Louisiana, where I was in this 600 square foot apartment. 
and I was in the bathroom. I had just begged the power man to turn the lights back on because if not, my daughter's milk was going to spoil. I had come home to eviction notices like a couple days before on the door. And I was at a point where it was like enough is enough. Like, Mm -hmm. how did I get here? What did I do? Why is this happening? And I got in the mirror and I was like crying and I said, God, why me? Why me? I've been a good person. I treat people well. I try to operate integrity. I did what they said to do. Go to school, get good grades, go start the business, get a job. I should be fine. Why am I here? I start bawling and ugly crying and ended up on the floor. And it wasn't until a still small voice said, get your Bible, get your Bible. And I got my Bible and I landed on this scripture, Proverbs 17, 16. And it said, what good is money in the hands of a fool if they have no desire to seek wisdom? Mm -hmm. And that scripture changed my life. And that scripture is why my Instagram handle seek wisdom to this day, right? Like that scripture changed everything. And that moment is where I believe I really embraced my purpose. I don't think I was necessarily searching for purpose or looking for purpose, but that's where it finally made sense to me that this journey was not just about chasing money. It was about seeking wisdom. And that was March 9, 2009. And ever since that time, I've been on this mission to share my experience and share my testimony in the hopes that it'll bring more people over to this idea of like, what you really want is purpose. You think is money Mm -hmm. because you think money is going to fulfill you and make you happy and give you joy. But what actually does that is purpose. And so that's what I've been doing for 12 years, girl. That's why I'm here. You've said so much just now. Well, first of all, I am a mom of twins. My twins were born 29 weeks. They were in the hospital for two and a half months. And I remember those days. And I remember the hospital bills. Just to think that you had to deal with that. And on top of it, deal with your business, watching your business just fall apart. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And just to look at where you are today is just amazing. And I think it shows the power of just never giving up and trusting the process and leaning into your faith. I'm curious to hear how over the past decade, your philosophy about money has changed. Oh, it's changed tremendously. When I was a young person, I'm first generation American, so... I come from a very hardworking family and I come from people who value hard work, right? So it was like, work hard, work hard. That could mean have seven jobs or that could mean when you do have a job, you go early, you stay late, you do the most to prove that you are a good person and a good worker and all that stuff. And so I always equated making more money with working harder. And early in my life, that came at the sacrifice of everything else. I wasn't necessarily worried about health. I wasn't necessarily worried about relationships. Success was making money and it was working hard. And that's what I did. And I did it well. And it wasn't until that hospital stay, you know, sometimes I think God has an interesting way of getting our attention, right? So I think the hospital stay was kind of like the, the pebble. It was like, hey, there's more to life than just like your work. So I had to focus on my health and my body and my spirit and all this stuff. And so as time has gone on, that's where the six pillars of wealth that I teach from now are. It's like over the last decade, I've just seen how much in my life changes and shifts when I'm focusing on the things that are not necessarily directly connected to money. When I have focused on my mental and my physical health. When I focus on my personal and professional relationships, when I focus on the space and the environment that I surround myself with, when I lean into my faith, there are so many financial principles connected with all these other areas of our life that we usually just dismiss in the name of chasing money and not chasing money from like, you're this evil person who's greedy and wants more and more money. Chasing money can be like, you hoard everything. Like all you do is save and you don't know how to like enjoy your life. There's different levels or some people are so consumed with paying off debt that they won't invest in themselves or do anything else. That's still a form of chasing money as well, right? I want to be sure that I define that for people, but my philosophy has changed so much because I see it as being more holistic. One of the things that happened to me in 2009 as well, I looked up a couple things. One was the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge was information. Wisdom was the application. We use them interchangeably, but they're not the same. We're information gatherers in our society. We love information. We will Google anything in a second. And we think that makes it 
like, oh, I know that. I know that. You know, you have people in your family. They're always like, I know that. I knew that. I know. But they don't know how to apply it. Therefore, you don't have wisdom just because you have Google search. You don't really have wisdom. Right. But also wealth. I was like, well, what is wealth really? And wealth, we have learned as a society is money and material possessions. That's the very surface level definition. But when I was digging deeper, I found, no, wealth, actually, the 12th century original definition was the condition of well-being. And so I'm at a place in my life, and I have been for years now, that I don't measure my success based solely on what's in my bank account. I don't measure how I'm doing just by how much money I made this month. Like, I measure it based on how are my relationships? How do I feel physically? How do I feel mentally? So I can have a lot of money in the bank, but if I allow my calendar to get chaotic, what does that have to do with anything? I don't feel wealthy. I don't feel wealthy at all. I feel hurried. I feel stressed. I feel rushed. I feel pressed. I feel like like I'm going nuts. That has nothing to do with a number in the bank or assets or any of that. So I've learned to look at wealth from a more holistic perspective. And I keep those pillars in front of me so that when I'm feeling out of whack, I know what I need to lean into. Like, okay, your people pillar is off. That has nothing to do with in the bank account. If I know I haven't been on top of my date nights, I need to get on top of my date nights. Or if I know I haven't been spending that type of time with my daughter, I see where the disconnect is coming. And I think for me, the work that I do, it's amazing how we're just not taught a lot of this stuff early on. We're taught to like, chase money so we assume that that must be the goal the end goal and when I have that I'll be fine but look at how many people commit suicide who are wealthy so for anyone that's listening to what you're saying and thinking well it's easy to say in your situation that it's not all about money can you maybe talk on how someone who is you know a financial situation that's not as good as yours might readjust their life so that they can also Chase purpose as opposed to money? Can you share maybe tips that they can apply? Yeah, I would say a lot of that is in the book, Redefine Wealth for Yourself. But I will say this, I've been saying these things and living this way well before the money came back. So it's funny, you know, what I love about Facebook now is that it does the memories and something will come up, the quotes or something I said, and it's like 2011, 2012, 2010. I had not been financially restored at that time. I was building a name for myself, but I was not financially restored. I wasn't a multiple six-figure earner again until about 2013. And I wasn't a seven-figure earner, none of those things. So I always tell people that you have to change your mindset, right? Before the money comes. It's not, oh, when the money comes, then I can think like you. No, I was thinking like this. And that's why I believe the money came back is because I was shifting me first, right? And so if I were to just talk about it in terms of the pillars, Some of the first stuff I did, get back in therapy, found ways to get therapy because I do believe that our business and our finances will only grow to the extent we're willing to heal. And I had to deal with a lot of the childhood trauma. I had to deal with some of the unsupportive habits I picked up from my family, loved them to pieces, but I learned a lot of stuff that was not productive, Mm -hmm. right? And even though I was educated and all this stuff, my family is my family. My experience is my experience. And so I was still taking some of those actions and ways of being into my life and they were impacting me and I couldn't even see it, right? So I had to do that work first. So let's say someone will say, well, I don't have money for therapy. So many apps out there, you can get it for $25 now. If you're gonna save up for something, do it for that. Because there's things you may need to heal in order to really make progress so that you can see the opportunity so that you can make better decisions with the money you do have, right? Something else I was doing early on when I was in New Orleans in that itty bitty apartment that I talked about earlier, one of the habits that my husband and I created was going down to this lakefront where they had these beautiful homes, big, beautiful homes in Metairie. And we used to go jogging. We used to push our daughter in a stroller and just jog up and down. And we would look at these big houses and we and they would have nice cars in the front and we'd be like, oh, been there, done that on the way back. It was a mantra that we created. And so, cause at the time we were driving a beat up yellow van. It was not safe. Yellow. It, was, it was a beat up yellow van. It was not safe by any stretch of the imagination. There was no place to put our daughter. We used to put her in a car seat in the middle between both of us. Totally. I don't even think it was in short girl. It was so bad, but 
we would come up with these stories and these mantras and these affirmations that we would recite over and over again. And one of mine used to be, I work because I want to, not because I have to. I work because I want to, not because I have to. Now, I didn't even have a job. I didn't have a job at that time. When I say, oh, been there, done that on the way back, I didn't have a how. I didn't have a plan. It was more so about conditioning my mind to go, this is temporary. This is not going to be forever. This is not how your story ends. This is not like God ain't brought you this far to leave you here. This is temporary. So we're see it as such. This is just a season, right? But a part of that going jogging too was like the physical health. I was like, am I in position to actually maintain and sustain what, it, what I say I'm praying for? Like, how do I feel about myself? A part of my physical health and getting that together was about getting my confidence up and getting my confidence back. Because when life has beat you down, especially financially, child, your confidence is in the toilet, <laughs> right? Like, absolutely, the confidence is bad, right? I mean, going into the bank is a struggle. Swiping your card, the stress, the stress, like swiping your card at Target is like, oh my God, is it going to go through? Let me go on a Friday when the bank is about to close and maybe something will squeeze through. I used to have all of the tricks because I was living in survival mode, right? But I was starting to put little things in practice and sticking to it. I was sustaining those little things with the belief that I would one day work because I want to, not because I have to. And so people always tell me that, Annalise, they're like, it's easy for you to say, no, when I started this, it wasn't easy to say. I thought I sounded crazy. I knew it sounded crazy because I didn't yet tangibly have any results, but I believed it in my core. And I believe that if I just stayed on that path, I think what happens is we don't see it immediately and then we give up. Mm -hmm. And the difference is people are committed, not interested. I literally said things until they became reality. And I think that that's even biblical. Like we have to speak life. We have to believe it. You don't get what you want. You get what you believe. Is it easy? No. Especially when things don't change immediately, right? Because we want things to happen. We're microwave generation. We think that, oh, I said affirmations yesterday. Where's my man? Where's my money? <laughs> Where's the baby? Where's the stuff, right? I said it. I said it on Sunday. I went to church. I prayed. I'm like, where's my miracle? But that's not happened. I think that miracles are in the momentum. Like it's a part of you showing up for the things that you say you want first. It's very interesting because I remember one of the things that I probably quote you once a month on this podcast. One of the things you say is an audience of one is still an audience. An audience of one is still an audience. And it's something that I've been carrying with me. And, you know, when things don't necessarily move as fast as I want them to, and I think it applies to like a wealth building journey or chasing your purpose or whatever goal you have, it's important to just keep that in mind. Like whatever, if I'm on step two, then I can help someone that's on step one. And it's just one person then just keep going for that one person. And that's been wonderful advice for me. And least that's what led me here. That's what led me here. It was when I started the blog, when I was in Louisiana and I got discouraged because my family wasn't reading. And I was like, well, if my mom and my husband aren't reading. Well, who should I expect? Like, if those are two people who I know love me. And if they're not reading, why would anyone read? And I stopped blogging. I was doing it weekly. And I remember at the time, my Caribbean father was like, you need a job. Like, you need to get a job. You need to get something to do. You should go back to school. What is going on with you? What's happening down there? And I just didn't feel led. Like, I was applying for jobs, but I didn't believe it, right? I didn't really want them, so I didn't believe it. And therefore, I never got a call back. Never, ever, ever did I get a call back <laughs> for a job. And so I was doing the blog weekly for some months there. And then I realized my husband and my mom weren't reading. I was like, who am I fooling? Let me get on LinkedIn and try to find a job and be an adult. I have a child now. You know, I talk myself to all the practical, logical things. And this gentleman reached out after I hadn't been blogging for some time. To this day, I consider him to be an angel. And he reached out. He emailed me. He said, hey, I hope you're well. I was enjoying your blog and haven't seen you post in a while. Hope you're okay. And I said, who is this stranger? What is he talking about? How did he find me? And that was the first time it even occurred to me to try to look at the analytics, like the back end. I was new to being online, so I didn't even understand that. And then I saw, oh, I had views. I was getting like 
85 views on this post or 100 views. And I was like, oh my gosh, people are actually finding it and looking at it. And that was when I decided, I'm like, you know what? Even if it's just for this man, I'm going to keep doing my blog. And that literally turned into me writing for other blogs and then writing for magazines and then starting radio and then doing my nationally syndicated segment with Steve Harvey for four years and all the features and the magazines and all this stuff. But still to this day, when I start something, I'm like, okay, guys. And I tell my team all the time and they're like, that doesn't even sound plausible. I'm like, look, we might only get 20 people in this program. And if we do, we're going to serve the mess out of them. We're going to serve them like it's 200 people. I'm going to show up on a 10 as much as I possibly can and like serve the heck out of them and make sure that they get whatever it is they came for. Some people are like, well, if 500 don't show up, I'm not going to do it. Okay, well, then you're not committed. Then you're not actually committed. I'm not saying that you have time to waste by any means. You know, maybe that feels like a waste of time for you. But I think coming from my background and having that philosophy of like an audience of one is still an audience. I'm going to show up and serve no matter what. I think that has been the foundation for my success, for like what I do, because people know that I'm going to do my best no matter who's there. I don't only show up when I feel, you know, when it seems impressive. I'm going to show up anyway because this is what I get to do, not what I have to do. I love it. This year, you had a podcast episode on paying for peace. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, you know, I really enjoyed the episode. I think that a lot of times we get stuck doing things that we don't necessarily want to do because we feel like we have to do them and we have to be the best at everything and we don't offload. Can you talk to us about that? Okay. I, I hate to keep bringing this back to like my Caribbean upbringing, but that's all I am. That's who I am, right? I used to feel a shame associated with getting additional support. It was this sense that like we should be able to do it all. And eventually, I think through therapy, but just through personal development in general, I came to see that by not getting the support that I really needed, I was really living in a previous generation story, right? So I grew up with a single mom and a single grandma. My grandma raised me when my mom was working quite a bit. And so they did a lot of things that they had to do. They didn't have the luxury of choice at that time. It wasn't like, oh, I can find someone to help clean my house, right? So they took a sense of pride, a certain sense of pride in being able to do all of the things to raise the kids and cook and clean and work. And like, they took pride in that and thank God for them. But this is a different day. This is a different season. There are certain things that I don't have to do because there's services that make it readily available. And I had to get away from what someone is gonna think. There's always an auntie with an opinion at least. You know, everybody has that good auntie that has an opinion or someone's like, you don't wipe your own baseboards? And you have someone. No, no, I don't. I don't. Are they clean though? They're clean. And the baseboards want to be clean, right? They don't care who's cleaning them. So I had to release this idea that I needed to be superwoman to do everything. Doesn't work for me. And there is a higher and better use of my time. And so instead of doing things that put me in a space of struggle and stress and like, oh, I'm forced to do this and takes me out of the flow of what I'm actually gifted and called to do, I've learned to pay for peace. And whenever I'm embarking on something new, even I will pay for support. I don't want to spend several weeks Googling and researching when there's someone here who is like proficient and an expert in that, that I can pay to come in and help us instead of. Let me take six months to research. Well, okay, (laughs) lots of stuff is going by, right? Like a lot of time is going by. There's a lot of missed opportunities. And so we also have to see the cost of wasting time doing things or researching or whatever on something that's not your ministry. Somebody else is really good at that. Bless them to operate in their gifts so you can operate in yours. So how has paying for peace impacted your finances? Oh, my finances are probably quadrupled. Hmm. I love it because... Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, when I am paying for peace in one area of my life, right? So let's take my housekeeper, for example. She comes three days a week. She comes Monday, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. So she works like half days, maybe four hours, four to five hours, and she batches her tasks, right? On Wednesday, she does laundry. 
If I did laundry, first of all, no way I would get it done in four to five hours. It would definitely be an eight to nine hour ministry, right? Because I already don't want to do it. It's, it's going to take me forever to fold. I'm going to be arguing with my daughter about how she folds because she's not helpful when folding clothes. <laughs> then it's putting it up. There's like all this stuff. Well, in eight or nine hours, based on my rates, there's a lot of things that I could get done. Those are podcast episodes that could be recorded. Those are speaking opportunities that I might have. That's time that I can spend thinking through how we're going to get more people in our next launch and our next program. That's time that I may be talking to my agent about brand partnerships I would like us to go over. So the investment of having Miss Jenny do the laundry on Wednesdays that allows me to now have the time and space and energy and creativity to think through my money making tasks. If I was doing laundry, my husband's not paying me to do laundry. Newsflash. I'm not getting anything for it. He's not, he's not paying. Not me. Right? So instead of using that time in that way, me being able to redirect my focus to things that I know I can do to create more income, there's no comparison. There's mm. absolutely no comparison. Paying Miss Jenny 150 bucks for the day versus me being able to do something that could create $15,000 Where's the comparison, right? And that didn't start now. I was doing that even when we didn't have the money. Yeah. I would love for you to expand on that because I yeah. remember that you shared some tips and tricks that you used when you didn't have the financial resources. Yep. When I didn't have the money that I have now, I even bartered with Miss Angela. Miss Angela used to help us take care of Reagan back in the day. And we had a spare bedroom and she needed room and board. We bought a little car that she could use to do her other gig, but also to pick Reagan up and go back and forth to school. And Miss Angela would cook and stuff, but we were really bartering for room and board. She lived with us. She was a teacher at one of Reagan's old schools. She was like an, a teacher's aide or something like that. And we just loved her. Reagan just loved her to pieces. She was like her Atlanta grandma. And so we were able to barter with her. And Miss Angela helping with Reagan allowed me to write my first book. Had Miss Angela not been there, all the hours that I was like, that I didn't have to worry about picking Reagan up from school because I could go to Starbucks and just sit there and really get the words out and work through it. Having Miss Angela and having that support helped me write the first book, which was the catalyst for so many. I mean, now I'm on my fifth book. So it was a catalyst for so much that would come, but it was like, how do I, right, get that level of support? I didn't have the money, but I was able to barter at that time, that was like 2011, I was able to barter. I remember when I first came to Atlanta, I bartered with a young lady. She needed to help like with the books and stuff for her salon. And so I was like, well, because I didn't have money for hair and nails. She had a full service salon. So you could get your hair done, nails done, eyebrows waxed, like all the stuff. I think lashes. I was getting everything. I was bartering with her. Okay. I need these services. So getting those services allowed me to keep myself kept up so that I could go out and network and meet people. That was like 2010. So I was able to use one of the things I was gifted in and skilled in. I bartered with her and I did that for probably 10 months or so. But for 10 months, I had my hair done. Now, financially, I had no money to be getting hair, nails, eyebrows, lashes, <laughs> but I looked like I had it, but I was bartering with her. And I just think that I mean, that was bartering, but like getting in the mindset that I'm willing to pay for peace or to use my gifts and skills to like get what I need in order to move what I want to do forward is also was like, for me, it was a wealthy habit. It was it's a wealthy ha habit to think right. that way. Cause I think a lot of us think in terms of scarcity. So we make it about what I can't do. Mm -hmm. And as long as you talk about what you can't do, you're not going to do it. You're not going to think through a way to make it happen. I love all of this. I think, you know, a lot of times we approach life from a place of lack. I don't have enough money to do this. Not necessarily thinking, hey, I could actually take this time to go earn more or I have resources. I can be creative and figure out a way to get that done. And I just love, love, love this. So I saw that you were recently featured in Success Magazine. Yeah. And you talk about scaling your joy. What are some of the ways listeners can scale their joy? I would say one of the first ways that we begin to scale our joy is to get clarity around what we really want. So 
I think a lot of times we spend so much of our time, we spend so much of our days, our energy, pursuing things that don't necessarily matter to us. They matter to the people we may love or they matter to people we may not even love. We just think that other people care much more than they do. So we spend a lot of time doing things for show and not for what really feels good in our souls. And for me, I've been learning more and more and more to listen to my soul. I feel like we are very intuitive beings. We've just been taught to deny or dismiss what we feel for the purposes of what sounds logical or what sounds rational. And sometimes what you want to dream big, dreams are not always logical or rational, right? Like the audacity to think that a little Belizean American girl from South Central Los Angeles could be on stages and be on national news and have these features in these huge magazine outlets and all this stuff, like the audacity, where does that come from? Nobody in my family, nobody in my neighborhood ever did anything like that, right? So you're already irrational if you're a dreamer. So let's just say that. But that means that you have to be willing to be clear about what you want and then be clear about your boundaries with other people and letting them know, even if I said I wanted that before, that's not what I want anymore. That's not who I am. That's not what matters to me. And then to really scale joy, it's like, how do I infuse my life? That means how do I infuse my calendar and my everyday to do's with the things that I actually want to do, the things that actually bring me peace and fulfillment and contentment and joy. Not because it looks good for the gram, but because in my spirit, it makes me happy. Like I feel it. And you know, every piece of me and for me, Scaling joy has looked like saying no to a lot of things. I've been saying no so much more. And it's a different level of no, right? Because I'm a very spirit-led and purpose-led person. So if things are not in alignment with my purpose, it's very easy for me to say no. Like I'll be like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> right? I'm like, it's so easy for me to say no. But now I think because so many people know that about me, the opportunities that I do get most of the time are wonderful and they are aligned and they are very purposeful. And they, at this point, they're lucrative and all of that. But my joy comes in not having a busy, hurried schedule. My joy comes in spending a lot of time alone. First and foremost, I spend a lot of time alone and then a lot of time with my family my husband and my daughter in particular, and then my siblings and parents, it looks like spending a lot of time with my faith. Like faith is a big part of my life. And that's for me, not just going to church. That's like the time I spend in my personal prayer closet. My life, I live by the six pillars. So joy doesn't look like choosing things that are work related all day, every day. It looks like, how do I build my calendar around these pillars? Mm -hmm. I love going to the gym. I love working out. I had therapy today. I have my life coach tomorrow. Like, you know, like that to me is scaling joy because there was one point where my calendar was so full. And if I'm not careful, it can get full very quickly. And I get in these cycles of just doing the most, but my calendar was so full and it was all things that I liked, but in totality, it, it wasn't giving me joy. So a part of scaling joy is also like boundaries and saying no, even mm -hmm. when things look good, everything that's permissible is not beneficial. And I had to like accept that just because I can doesn't mean I should. I love it. So Patrice, I'd like to end the interview with a round of rapid fire questions. Can you tell me about a book that changed your perspective on life? Yes, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz totally changed my perspective. Steve Harvey gave me that book when I was an intern around 19 or 20 years old. And I think it was a part of the foundation for who I am now. Just The Magic of Thinking Big. What's one thing about money you wish you could tell your younger self? That money in and of itself is not enough. It's you want peace, you want purpose, you want fulfillment. What's the best investment in yourself you've made so far? Oh, therapy. Filling the blanks. Money to me is? Money to me is a tool. What do you want your legacy to be? That I helped millions of people redefine wealth for themselves. I love it. Patrice, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, for sharing your story, your expertise. Please tell the dreamers where to find you. Dreamers, you can find me at patricewashington.com. There's an overview there of the six pillars. You just click on start here if you want to learn more about those. 
And if you love social media, come join me on Instagram at Seek Wisdom PCW. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was Patrice Washington. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Dreamers Podcast. You can find the episode show notes and all of the links mentioned at dreamoflegacy.com. If you liked today's episode, here's what you can do to support me and help more dreamers discover the podcast. Follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Rate and review the podcast to help the podcast gain more visibility. Share the podcast with your family, friends, and coworkers. And if you really enjoyed today's episode, please take a second to tag me at the dreamers that podcast on Instagram and let me know what you liked about today's episode. All right, dreamers, that's it for today. I will see you back here next week for another episode of the Dreamers Podcast. Okay, dreamers. Time to this, legacy. this podcast is for general information purposes only. It is not intended to provide any tax, legal, financial planning, insurance, accounting, investment, or any other kind of professional advice or services. Please consult with an appropriate tax, financial, or legal professional to receive appropriate advice based on your situation. Sunday, skincare day, is one of the ways I keep my sanity in these crazy times. Jumino is an all-natural, black-owned skincare brand, carefully handcrafted by parents who could not find the proper care solutions to address their family skin problems. All Jumino products are made of organic and high-quality ingredients meticulously chosen to give your skin the smooth results and the glow it deserves.